I'm going to do something today that I've never done at an academic conference. And that is, I'm going to spend my 15 minutes telling you a story. So, but before I do that, I want to just say a couple words. In my paper, I lay out the argument that Hizmet is a peace movement, that their goal is world peace. And if you look at it from the philosophical underpinnings from Fatula Gulen, to the emphasis on constant uh, self-improvement at the individual level, to how the organizations and institutions embed the values and the philosophies and their practices. At every level, you can see that the goal ultimately is world peace. And this is what every Hizmet Movement member is working for at every moment. So let's get to the story. You know, why a story? Well, for one, the story I'm going to tell you is quite remarkable. But more than that, it's a particular story conveys in a very concrete way what his met is all about. And in that sense, it's not really remarkable at all. Because the approach, the method, the impact that you're going to hear in this story, you can find in any Hizmet organization and institution. So perhaps my story is more dramatic. I don't want to oversell it, but, but maybe not so remarkable in Hizmet terms. Sorry, I'm short. i got to adjust this. <laughs> Our story takes place in Nigeria, but I'm not going to spend time giving you the Nigerian context, and we're very fortunate tomorrow Dr. Sani is going to give that to us, and I simply don't have the time. Uh, so I'm going to start with our protagonist, who is Mr. Jim. That's what the Nigerians called him. And in 1999, just two years out of university, he was 28 years old, he left Istanbul for Abuja, Nigeria. And he went there to become the Turkish language teacher and the house master of the newly formed Nigerian Turkish International School in Abuja, which is the capital city of Nigeria. Now we're going to fast forward two years later. And uh, at that time, there was a former minister of agriculture. And he was really happy with the school in Abuja. And so he made a proposition to the administrators there. And he said, I have this property. It's located outside of Kaduna, which is the fourth largest city in Nigeria. And it's not being used. And I think you guys, why don't you go down there and start a school? And I'll help you get the property in shape. And so they made an agreement. And uh, Mr. Jim, he was given this task to go down uh, to this village. Uh, renovate the property and open the school. And so in April 2002, he left. And, uh, and he had no idea what he was getting in for. Uh, he didn't know really the history of the place. And uh, this is a very common characteristic in his med stories. So he arrived to find a sprawling complex, overgrown and dangerous grass over his head, hundreds of unattended trees infested with all manners of insects hundreds of poisonous snakes, scorpions, wild animals, <laughs> no running water, no electricity. So in just a few, a few months to get the place in shape. So he got to work. In the mornings, he would go out and visit the surrounding schools and meet with the teachers. And he was basically looking for bright students that he could offer scholarships for, for the first class. And then he would come home around 2 p.m grab his machete, and start hacking at the grass. And just to make this very brief, this renovation included dealing with infestations of poisonous snakes, pumping honey out of unused wells in which bees had taken up residence, trimming and fumigating 370 infested mango trees, installing security fencing around the perimeter, converting some of the small cottages to office, classroom, and dormitory space, and what this uh, place was, is while this minister was in office, he had intended this to be housing for, st for state workers from the Department of Agriculture. And it was about 64 bungalows, but unfortunately, 
nothing was ever completed, nobody ever lived there. It was basically abandoned for 15 years. So he was going about his work, uh, visiting the schools, uh, with working on the renovation, and he started, Mr. Jimmy started to hear rumors. And he heard that in the village churches, it was being announced that the Turks were establishing an Arabic school. And the ministers were saying, don't send your kids there. So you can imagine this is an uncomfortable situation, right? This is a potential conflict. And our human nature is we want to stay away from that. But this is not what Mr. Jim did. Instead, he immediately started visiting the churches. And he started meeting with the pastors and the parishioners and getting to know each other and sharing dinners and inviting them to his home and taking them tours of the school. And this is what he told them. He said, I'm not an imam. I'm not a pastor. For me, all children are the same. I'm an educator. This is a science-oriented school. Your children are free to learn and practice their religion. Now, in Nigeria, they have a compulsory religious education from the state. And I believe it's two hours a week. So nor typically what would happen if Christians were running the school, they would offer Christian education. If Muslims were running the school, they would offer Islamic education. And so the Christian pastors were assuming that this is what was going to happen at this you know, Islamic school. But uh, Mr. Jim said, no, this is not the case. Christian students would have a Christian religious teacher and Islamic students an Islamic religious teacher. And he said, look, you guys give me the teacher who you think is best to teach the students Christianity. And he said, and I'm also going to renovate one of those cottages so that it can be used for worship services for the Christian students. And it is a boarding school, and some students don't go home, and so maybe they need a place for their Sunday worship service. So he continued this dialogue. And he also was very concerned about safety because they were located uh, about, um, I believe, five miles from the capital. And the hospital is far away. So he decided to hire a nurse. And they started going out and touring around the village. And at that time, he said the people were so poor that they didn't even have money to buy one tablet to save their lives. And so they did this. And even they did save a young 18-year-old man's life. And Mr. Jim said, we're going to open a small clinic with the school. And so they did that. They had a free clinic. And this helped establish a lot of trust and tensions were easing quite a bit. And then Mr. Jim started to learn more about the village. And what he learned was that uh, nearly everybody in that village were Christian refugees. They had fled there two years prior due to religious conflict in Kaduna uh, over, the, over the implementation of Sharia law. And nearly every single villager, they had either lost a relative in that riot or they had been personally maimed, like losing a limb, or injured in some kind of severe way. And so here, he learned, <laughs> he's opening this, what they see as Islamic school, in uh, this village surrounded by uh, Christian refugees from a religious riot. OK, well, they proceeded. His uh, new wife, Sophia, also a teacher, joined him for the opening of the school, as did two single Turkish men, and also uh, another Turkish family, uh, the fall semester went underway. They started with 27 seventh grade uh, boy students for their first class. And then a big crisis hit in November. Uh, riots started in the city, a religious riot. And they were there sitting ducks in this Christian enclave with no way out and no one to rescue them. And also the students there, their parents, some of them were parliamentarians, high-level government officials. I mean, they were just serious. They were like kidnap targets. So what are they going to do? So they quickly made a plan. And he says, we decided to hide the children in the septic tanks, a place for dirty water for, for each home. And these were unused septic tanks from the bungalows. And each staffer was assigned four kids. 
So the fighting started. The villagers blocked the main roads with burning tires. People could not pass. For four days, there was no movement. In our area, Muslim people ran away. Even Muslim staff ran away. Nobody stayed with us, just Turkish staff, teachers, and students. We could not go anywhere. Not far from our school was a mosque. They burned it. They burned homes with people inside. In the city, the Christians' places were burned. In our village, the Muslim places were burned. Then, so Mr. Jim asked for help from an unexpected source. One of his staffers called... Uh, one of the religious leaders of the village and said, you know, we're here, we can't leave. You know, what are we going to do if somebody attacks our school? They're going to kill us. Uh, and the minister said, don't worry, we know you, and we're going to organize a guard duty. And that's what he did, is they posted a guard every 100 meters around that school, around the clock, and until the violence had passed. So... Um, he says, even if somebody tried to attack, the guards stopped them. They said, these people are good people. They're not like other Muslims. They're good Muslims. And Mr. Jim says, the Christian people, they saved us. So his wife, Sophia, she tells a much more intimate portrait about what happened inside the school while they were worried about all the externalities. And she said, they were worried, what are they going to do if their Christian neighbors come to the gate? And this happened. And you can see, <laughs> this is a real time of uncertainty because at that point, uh, these were Christian neighbors. They had never come to the school before. And they're knocking on the door. Do you answer? Do you ignore and hope they're going to go away? Well, they went to the gate. The Christian neighbors said, uh, you know, we're scared, and we feel like your school is the safest place, and we want to stay here. And in the end, 10 Christian families stayed with them throughout the, the riot for about a week. They ate with them in the cafeteria, and as Sophia says, she says, we prayed together. We prayed with the Christians how they are praying, and when we read Quran, they listened with us. Outside, Christians and Muslims are fighting against each other. Inside, they're praying together to solve the problem. Uh, for two or three days, we didn't do our regular program, but after that, we started the school. You know, really, it was remarkable the Christian neighbors came. Sophia explained, the neighbors, they know the school, but they don't know what we are teaching, and they're afraid of us because they're thinking we're a Muslim school. That week was the first time they'd come to our school. They're thinking we'll change their children's religion. After the week, they know we came here, but not to change the religion. They understand we just love the people. After that week, they trusted us. The neighbors became so close to us. When we needed help preparing the school, painting, preparing the roof, working in the garden, before, we couldn't get our Christian neighbors to work there. But after that, we found people easily. So, in the short span of three months, how is it that you can live a lifetime that one's heart can transform from hate to love, that enemies can become protectors? In Mr. Jim's school in Nigeria, the Christians saved the Muslims. The Christians who had been uprooted from their homes, injured, suffered loss of family members, and the Muslims sheltered the Christians. It could have so easily gone the other way. Eventually, out of safety concerns, the school was moved uh, to the city. After the rise, the parents wanted their children closer. The school is still open today. And in fact, in Nigeria now, there are 18 schools. They serve about 3,500 students. Nigeria, in the capital of Abuja, also has Nile University, and it's the only uh, Hizmet University in all of Africa. And also, just this past August, in Nigeria, they opened up a world-class hospital with all of the uh, state-of-the-art facilities, equipment, and I, be I believe about 12 uh, doctors from Turkey came there. So, I think my time is up. Thank you very much.